Okay, thank you, and uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this nice occasion to celebrate together with Boris. And uh, I'll try not to overshoot the time. So let me start. Uh, I will essentially talk about, I changed a bit the title, so this density resolved is almost disappearing, <coughs> but instead I added a little bit of quantum. So I will talk about the spreading of nonlinear wave packets, and uh, finally, time permitting, come to two little puzzles with just two quantum interacting particles, which nevertheless seem to be <coughs> open issues. So uh, we had already some uh, discussion about Anderson localization. So let me start straight into uh, this simple equation. This is a discrete Schrodinger equation on a one-dimensional uh, chain. And uh, psi is a complex scalar. L is the lattice site number. And here's the disorder, epsilon L, which uh, are random uncorrelated numbers drawn with equal probability from a, an interval of width w. And here's the hopping with strength 1. So the widths of uh, the spectrum of the eigenvalues, eigenfrequencies, eigenenergies of this problem is capital delta, 4 plus w. Now, the surprising thing, which was uh, found first by Anderson a long time ago, is that all eigenstates of this, the corresponding eigenvalue problem, which you see here, are exponentially localized with a uh, localization length, which is a unique function of the eigenvalue. So all these states roughly look like in this cartoon. So they occupy a certain part in space, which I call localization volume. And sometimes, most of the time, I'll call it capital L, sometimes also capital V. And of course, it's related to the localization length, but by numbers, it's not exactly the same thing. So uh, it's usually two or three times larger than the localization length. I can also basically be very brief on that. We already heard about a successful uh, experimental efforts to observe Anderson localization in a variety of physical settings. In particular, I want to focus uh, your attention on uh, the experiments done with light and with ultra-cold atomic gases, Bose-Einstein condensates, because in both cases uh, you can tune the nonlinearity, respectively the two-body interaction strengths, and uh, get the system into uh, a nonlinear wave equation, or respectively a many-body problem in the quantum case. So therefore, uh, the motivation, which actually goes back straight to discussions, again, initiated by uh, Boris back in the time in Max Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, the, the idea then was to look uh, at this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this is the previous equation we have seen, but now we add a nonlinear term here, which is proportional to psi to the cube. And there is a parameter beta here in front, which controls uh, the strength of that term. And then the question is, what will happen to a spreading wave packet? And you can generalize that to basically any uh, wave equation problem where the linear uh, wave equation uh, has eigenstates which are all localized with a finite upper bound on the localization length. And then you add some kind of short range nonlinearity like this one, and you follow the spreading of an initially localized wave packet pretty much uh, asking the same question as Anderson asked in his seminal work. And then you ask whether it stays localized or whether it can delocalize. And there are two um, possible answers. The first one is it will, of course, delocalize because when you excite a wave packet in an empty system, you will always excite a finite number of eigenstates, normal modes of the linear wave equation. And due to the nonlinearity, they will now interact with each other. So you, from a dynamical point of view, you have a system with several degrees of freedom excited. And uh, the chance that this system is integrable is essentially seems to be zero. And therefore, uh, you can expect that there will be chaotic dynamics inside this wave packet. And chaotic dynamics will destroy phase coherence. But when you destroy phase coherence, you will destroy wave localization in the first place. So therefore, there should be some kind of incoherent uh, uh, excitation of the exterior of the wave packet, which will lead to a spreading of the wave packet. The other answer is no, because there are conserved quantities. At least there is typically an energy which is conserved, 
but uh, in this case of uh, Schrodinger equation, there's a particle number or the total norm, which is also conserved. And then um, if you look at the spreading, if you assume that your wave packet does spread, then in the course of spreading, the densities inside the wave packet will become small. And that means that this term here should become very small in the course of time during spreading. And therefore, it would be tempting to neglect this term at some sufficiently large time. And if you do that, you are back to Anderson localization. And so your wave packet should actually get stuck and not spread. OK, so uh, let's uh, see what will indeed happen. But uh, before coming to that here, let's look at these equations, the same equations of motion uh, in the normal mode space. That is, you take the equations in real space and you transform, do a canonical transformation into normal mode space. So the fine news are now the amplitudes, the complex amplitudes of the new eigenmode of the linear wave equation. And what you see is indeed when beta is the nonlinear parameter is 0, then uh, you deal with a set of non-interacting harmonic oscillators. And of course, you will enjoy still uh, Anderson localization in such a setting. However, when beta is non-zero, you get an interaction between these normal modes in forms of these triplets. Uh, and there are some uh, vertices here, some overlap integrals i, which are essentially given by sums over products of, in general, four different eigenvectors of uh, the eigenstates of the linear wave equation. New counts the eigenmodes. You can count as you want. You can count them in space, as I'm doing here right now, by their position, roughly speaking. But you can also, of course, sort the eigenmodes with respect to uh, their energy or some other parameter. And so uh, then what we will do is we will follow the dynamics of the wave packet. And we will look at, for instance, the normalized distribution of the norm density of that wave packet. And we'll measure the second moment of this distribution. Uh, which is sensitive to the location or to the distance of the two tails from the center of the wave packet. So we will have a good idea about uh, whether this wave packet stays localized or not. A bit more on numbers. Uh, so we already uh, mentioned the total width of the spectrum. We talk about the lattice. So the spectrum is bounded from both sides. It has a finite width, which is in our case here W plus 4. And in an example of uh, disorder strength 4, which by the way, it means that the localization length is of order 6. Uh, this number uh, ends up to be 8. And then uh, the size or the localization volume of each eigenstate, which I call here L, uh, is, of course, also depending on the disorder. It's the bigger, the weaker the disorder. And in our example, it's about 15 to 20, let's say 18. So a typical state can occupy 18 sites in the real lattice. Now, because of the nonlinearity, this uh, any given state will be coupled to a number of other uh, eigenstates of the linear wave equation. And uh, this number will be roughly equal to the size of the eigenstate itself because there is a direct correspondence between the number of sites in our lattice and the number of eigenstates of the eigenvalue problem. So then if we take, let's say, these 18 other eigenstates which uh, are now, through nonlinearity, interacting with a given one. Then we can look at their uh, eigenvalues, sort them, and look at the uh, level spacing of this set of uh, eigenstates, and arrive at this uh, average frequency or eigenvalue, eigenenergy spacing inside the localization volume called little d. And that's a new frequency scale, or energy scale, which is roughly given by capital delta over capital L. And it is the smaller, the weaker the disorder. In our case, it's of the order of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. And then there is another number which comes from the uh, nonlinear terms, because, uh, and that's the nonlinear frequency shift. So nonlinearity in the first place, as you know, renormalizes uh, frequencies or energies, and uh, like in any unharmonic oscillator. And this renormalization, very brutally speaking, is proportional to beta times some norm or norm density. And then you can compare now these numbers and end up with the possibility of three different regimes. One, when this uh, uh, frequency shift, nonlinear frequency shift, is much smaller than the level spacing little d, uh, then this regime we will call weak chaos for reasons to come. And then when this uh, frequency shift is larger than the level spacing little d, then we can uh, be in a regime of fully developed strong chaos when all uh, normal uh, eigenstates 
uh, strongly renormalized and uh, resonantly interact with each other. And if this frequency shift is even bigger, uh, such that it roughly exceeds the width of the full spectrum of the linear wave equation, you enter uh, the world of self-trapping or discrete breathers, uh, which means that you renormalize parts of your system such strongly that uh, their frequencies are completely tuned out of resonance with their neighborhood, and uh, therefore these states can stay for very long times, uh, again, being localized, but for a different reason, or even be exact localized eigenstates, uh, solutions of the nonlinear wave equations. Okay, so now let's see what happens when you switch on your computer. Uh, this was first done by uh, Mario Molina from Chile in 98, but it was a very preliminary study. Then there was work by Shepeliansky and Pikowski, by us and uh, by many more. And uh, here's an example of what happens when you start with your wave, pack wave packet being localized on just a single site. And uh, we let it go and we uh, integrate the equations of motion and we look at the second moment as a function of time on this log log, uh, in this log log plot. And uh, when beta, the nonlinear parameter, is equal to zero, we get this orange line, a horizontal line. The second moment doesn't change as it has to be. This is Anderson localization. The wave packet doesn't spread at all. Of course, the single site spreads into a lingual excitation spreads into the uh, single particle localization volume, but uh, in uh, the uh, frame of the normal mode representation, none of the normal modes changes uh, its norm, and therefore the distribution of the norm in normal mode space is strictly constant. Now, when you switch on some uh, nonlinearity, let's say you look at this blue curve, you find now that the second moment uh, still stays around the old value, but starts to fluctuate. This is these fluctuations are entirely due to uh, the nonlinear interaction between the modes. And then at some point, you start to see a growth of the second moment and uh, consequently a, a departure from Anderson localization. And when you increase uh, the nonlinearity even further, you basically push this, uh, this growth point to shorter times and you see from scratch uh, a growth of the second moment and a loss of Anderson localization. If you look at uh, the way this happens, uh, these look like, these are individual realization uh, results here. You see it more or less, well, can be approximated by a straight line. This is a log-log plot, which means we have a power law. And if you try to estimate the power uh, and take, for instance, this dashed line, uh, the slope is 1 over 3, which means we are in a very deep subdiffusive regime. It's a very slow process. Uh, the slope equal 1 would correspond to normal diffusion Slope 2 is ballistics, but here instead we have 1 over 3, or something like that. So uh, in this cartoon, you see how the wave packet is spread in one of the runs. And if you now look at the end time of the simulations, uh, and you look at the distribution of the densities, of the norm densities, you find uh, here uh, this distribution as a function of the space parameter uh, on a linear scale, and down here exactly the same thing on a log scale. So what you find is a broad distribution with exponential tails, which are the remnants of Anderson localization. And the further you integrate the uh, system in time, the further you kind of push these uh, exponential tails uh, away from the center of the wave packet. And these uh, little bars here indicate the size to which the wave packet is allowed to grow or to be within uh, the linear uh, equation. So we see a clear uh, destruction, if you wish, of Anderson localization. And uh, in practice, we can reach uh, an increase of the size of the wave packet, which is of up to two orders of magnitude larger than uh, the uh, size in the linear wave equation. We cannot go further because of time restrictions. This takes quite some time to integrate this uh, on a machine. And uh, we can go further. We can stretch this thing to 10 to the 9 and even 10 to the 10. And uh, we basically see the same features, but we can't go further. OK, so uh, as I already uh, indicated, uh, one of the ideas is that, yes, uh, this wave packet must destroy Anderson localization and start to spread because of chaos and because of dephasing. If so, and if the dephasing uh, of the normal modes is strong enough, then it shouldn't harm if we just do the same in parallel by hands, which means we repeat these uh, simulations 
uh, but now instead of just running the computer uh, and, and look what happens, uh, we will stop from time to time the simulation, transform the field in real space into, which is where we integrate the equations, into normal mode space, do a phase reshuffling in the normal mode space, so randomize the phases in normal mode space, transform back into real space and continue integration. And then repeat the same process again after some suitable time lag of let's say 100 or something like that. And what we get are these lines. They again follow more or less a straight line. The slope is different and can be roughly estimated to be uh, one half. Again, sub diffusion, but faster. So, which means that uh, in this uh, original data, what we observe is a sub diffusive process, which must be probably due to chaos, but which is weak. That is, uh, not all modes are uh, strongly dephasing in suitably short times. Uh, because otherwise there shouldn't be any difference between uh, the, the computer results uh, or the integration of the equations of motion or integrating plus dephasing by hand. So uh, if you try to dig a bit and try to understand what's going on, you can start playing games like this. You write down the, here again the equations of motion in normal mode space. Here are the overlap integrals. And then you say, OK, maybe we don't need chaos. Let's replace the whole problem by an integrable Hamiltonian, you see, which depends only on the actions, but which carries the whole network of, int uh, of connecti the connectivity network between the normal modes of the original equation, uh, because here are the corresponding overlap integrals. But it takes you one line to see that, of course, uh, this Hamiltonian will not produce any uh, new spreading. It will follow Anderson localization as it happens for the linear uh, wave equation. The next thing you can do is you take these uh, uh, equations in normal mode space, you do a local gauge on each of the normal modes such that you remove this term here, this linear term here in front, and basically arrive at oscillating terms in this uh, nonlinear sum, uh, which now contain frequencies which are combinations of typically four different eigenvalues of the linear wave equation. And then you could say, OK, let's uh, average these oscillation, uh, oscillations out. There's still something remaining uh, of, uh, of all these equations here, of all these terms. But if you solve that problem, you find that it's, first of all, integrable. And secondly, that it, again, doesn't lead to any spreading of a wave packet. So indeed, uh, there is a reason to assume that uh, chaos is important in, the, in this process. And uh, also terms which we threw out by averaging over time are important. So if you place them back and you look at one of those terms, and it's clear that we have to focus on uh, these quadruplets of, on these frequencies, which are these quadruplets here, which are small numbers, then you immediately see that you have to try to estimate whether some uh, naive perturbation approach will break down or not, and uh, come up with an estimate for a probability of a resonance. That is, you now want to see whether in your wave packet some given normal mode uh, can be treated uh, uh, using perturbation theory through its interaction with the other normal modes which surround it or not. And uh, yes or no, this depends essentially on, uh, uh, on a factor which involves this ratio of the quadruplet, which you see up here, and the overlap integral. And then uh, to cut a, short, a long story short, uh, if you uh, work this uh, thing through, you end up with a probability that uh, given, uh, let's say, a wave packet which, with a more or less uh, equal norm density inside the wave packet, then the probability that a randomly chosen normal mode in that wave packet will satisfy the resonance condition, that is, will not be, you cannot treat it uh, in perturbation theory, is given by this expression, 1 minus e to the power minus beta times the density, n, little n is the density of the normal mode, uh, over the level spacing. And then you see, of course, that when uh, n becomes very small, assume that your wave packet spreads a lot, so the density becomes small, you expand this and you see that the probability becomes uh, small, not zero, but small, linear in n, and becomes the smaller, the smaller n, while in the uh, other limit, when uh, n is big enough, this probability is essentially expected to be one. 
So uh, then comes the next step, uh, which is to develop some kind of uh, estimate for this, uh, for this spreading process, which, is, which was called by others effective noise approach. So basically, you assume that you have a wave packet which is spreading, which is chaotic inside, and you want to know at which time a new uh, mode which is sitting in the exterior of this wave packet uh, with uh, counting number mu will be excited to the level of the wave packet and become one with it. For that, you have to uh, write down some uh, stochastic differential equation. This is the equation of motion for that exterior mode. Uh, and what is important are the forces which come from the wave packet modes, which we assume in time to be random. So we have a Gaussian white noise uh, function here, f of t. And then what is important is to estimate the prefactor. It's, of course, proportional to beta. It's proportional to the cube of the amplitudes of the wave packet modes. And then uh, comes the purely phenomenological uh, uh, step which we had to do in order to save our lives, uh, namely to assume that it also is uh, depending or proportional to the probability to have at least one resonance inside the wave packet. Because if there is no resonance, then of course the wave packet should not spread. So if you do that, uh, then you come up with an estimate for the diffusion rate. And this diffusion rate, as you see, is a function now of the density. So it's not a constant. It's a, it's a thing which depends on the density. And this, the, smaller, the smaller the density is. And then uh, you can happily write down the final result because you know that the second moment is essentially 1 over the density squared. Because the, the bigger the wave packet, the smaller the density. So uh, distance immediately translates into uh, densities or into inverse densities. And then you can close the whole uh, equations and come up with uh, the following results. That uh, under these assumptions in the long-term limit, in the asymptotic limit, the second moment should grow like t to the 1 over 3. But uh, there can be an intermediate regime when uh, beta n uh, over the level spacing is not less than 1 but larger than 1. Then you indeed can obtain uh, a subdiffusive regime where the second moment will grow as t to the 1 half. Now, instead of bombarding you with uh, lots of numerical data, let me just try to uh, summarize uh, everything here in these few words. So we do, of course, many computations. We do averaging over thousands of disorder realizations, et cetera, et cetera. And what do we find? We can basically say that we can uh, confirm uh, a regime, an asymptotic regime of weak chaos for spreading wave packets where the exponent can be estimated to be 0.33 plus minus 0.02. So which means 1 over 3 is uh, well inside this uh, result. For the nonlinear Schrodinger equation with disorder, we did not yet fully observed a nice, fully developed intermediate regime of strong chaos. We see an onset of that, but not a fully developed regime over several decades in time. However, what we can do is we can generalize this uh, approach, which uh, I discussed here, to higher dimensions of the lattice, to different exponents uh, which uh, describe the nonlinear term instead of cubic terms, quintic terms, or whatever you want. And then we can check uh, uh, the results and apply them not only to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, but to a variety of other models as well. For instance, we observe the same weak chaos regime in the Aubry André. Uh, uh, potential. So instead of, instead of a, a disorder potential, we choose a quasi-periodic potential, which was discussed today already by Zora Shlepnikov. And we find, again, exactly the same uh, asymptotic spreading with exponent 1 over 3. We take other uh, models uh, of coupled oscillators called Klein-Gordon models, which essentially are different, I think, by not conserving the norm or anything similar to that but simply conserving the total energy, we find the same weak chaos regime in these Klein-Gordon models as well. We go to uh, dynamical localization in the quantum kick rotor. Uh, we uh, consider a nonlinear version of this quantum kick rotor and again find uh, spreading with the same exponent 1 over 3 in this case. And we also checked that uh, in the two-dimensional uh, disordered nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, we also again, find the proper weak chaos uh, spreading with a different exponent because you have to look at this outcome of these generalizations. 
And we do observe strong chaos as an intermediate process in these Klein-Gordon models and also in the nonlinear quantum kick rotor system. Uh, and also maybe just uh, briefly to mention that uh, since we basically talk about uh, a process which is nonlinear diffusion, then you can go back in time and look at the uh, results which were found by Zildovich, Kampanets, and Barenblatt on nonlinear diffusion equations on self-similarity and scaling properties of uh, their solutions. And we checked that as far as we could and found very good agreement as well with the data of our spreading wave packets. Now, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is, however, uh, a bit different from some of the, uh, the other models which I mentioned in the following, that it does conserve two quantities, the energy, which you see here again, and uh, the total norm, or the number of particles in the classical version. Uh, then you can introduce uh, densities, right, like I discussed already before, but we have two densities. We have the norm density, a little x, and the energy density, a little y, which we scale from the original densities by just multiplying them with this nonlinear parameter beta. And then uh, we can remember that there was a paper already in 2000 where people studied this model uh, for the ordered case, so w equals zero. So basically, this term is not present. Uh, they looked at that model, and they asked, uh, what are the statistical properties of that model? How did they address this issue? They said, OK, let's take a partition function like that one, a Gibbs distribution, with some chemical potential and a positive temperature, and let's see. Uh, which parts of this density space can be addressed by uh, such a distribution. So it's not a question about dynamics. It's a pure kind of a statistical uh, approach. The answer is that uh, uh, there is a forbidden region, which you see here, this inaccessible region. And then there is a zero temperature line, which is this bottom line here, which... Uh, you can also find uh, corrections for the uh, case with disorder, but maybe I shouldn't stress that too much here, but we can talk about that later if you want. So basically, there is a zero temperature line, and then there are states above uh, that line which you can address using such a partition function. And then there's an infinite temperature line, which is this line which you see here, and, uh, and that's the end. That's the end which you can reach by a Gibbs distribution. However, uh, that's not the end of the model because you can still address all, those, all, all, these, uh, all this white area up here, which is called non-Gibbs. So you can address uh, this area in terms of densities, but you cannot describe this using a Gibbs distribution with positive temperatures. You can formally uh, describe it with negative temperatures, but you have to think what it means. So what the upshot is actually, what the outcome is of all this, is if you go in there and you look at the dynamics of your system, you will find that your system tends to uh, segregate into two parts. So basically, your wave, your field uh, decomposes into two components, one which is strongly self-trapped and sits on certain sites, and another one which is floating around and presumably has uh, an effective temperature T equal to infinity or something close to that. But uh, uh, the other truth is also that if you actually go into this thermalized region and go here to very large densities, you basically see the same thing. The difference probably is in the lifetimes of this of uh, self-trapped component. But other than that, you find uh, a lot of similarity also in the thermalized region because when you go to large densities, you basically enter self-trapping, as I discussed already before. And uh, therefore, this region, of course, is not of interest when we look at uh, destruction of Anderson localization due to nonlinearity. But what is of interest is this area around zero. Now, still, if you are close to zero, uh, there, there is this uh, Gibbs non-Gibbs uh, transition line, which uh, might be uh, you know, important or can be studied. So what I can tell you right now is the following. First of all, if you look at the wave packet which spreads, and you assume that at any time you can characterize this object uh, uh, by two densities, by an energy density and uh, a norm density. In this assume, I mean that it makes sense. You can always do that, but that it really makes sense. 
then uh, you get some point here in this uh, phase space, in this parameter space. And as you spread, the densities decrease. And since they are linearly dependent on each other, essentially you now follow a straight line which goes straight down to zero. So that's the fate of your spreading wave packet if it will do so ad infinitum. And then, in principle, it can happen that you can start somewhere here and in the thermalized region, and then you see if you have positive energy densities, ultimately you'll have to hit this Gibbs non Gibbs line and enter the non Gibbsian regime. And the upshot so far is that we don't see uh, any peculiar behavior in the spreading of the wave packet when we hit that line, whatever the reasons and whatever the consequences of, of that uh, fact are. If we go too high here, of course, we see self-trapping, we see non-Gibbs, we see everything, but if we are close to, to, if we are at small densities, positive densities, we don't see any significant effect coming from this crossing. The other thing is that uh, there's this little d, the average spacing, which is a scale which comes from the uh, disorder problem, and that uh, little d can be directly now compared to x, which if you remember is beta times the norm density. So uh, somewhere here is a, is a marker which is shifted more and more down to zero uh, the weaker the disorder is. And, uh, and that's the interesting region where we observe our weak uh, chaos spreading dynamics. And uh, we can actually see uh, spreading uh, wave packets down to uh, density values x, which are as low as uh, 0.01 times the average spacing. So we are really, we can really go deep into this a weak chaos regime and still observe happily spreading wave packets. However, at the same time, exactly in this interesting region of weak chaos, uh, there will be ultimately another interesting uh, phenomenon appearing, which is uh, going back to Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser, which says that if you want to launch a wave packet uh, at these small values of densities, you will have a finite probability that uh, your wave packet will not spread. And this is basically uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence to the fact that you have a final probability that there will be no resonance inside the wave packet. So then these wave packets will not spread. But there is always a complementary probability that there will be something, uh, some resonances, and then uh, you apparently can spread. So inside this, this region of weak chaos, we expect this CAM regime, which was also discussed by Denise Basco, uh, in some earlier papers. And uh, in that sense, you can actually uh, view these spreading wave packets as objects which you launch outside the CAM regime. And then uh, with probability one, you have a chaotic trajectory. It starts to spread, but uh, at large enough times, you actually enter a CAM regime, but you are still staying on a chaotic trajectory, which might be quite interesting. And this is maybe also an interesting regime where, uh, as now, is very fashionable again, thanks to Boris and Igor and uh, Denis Basco's work, at least uh, initiated by that, uh, to look for non agotic regimes with uh, finite conductivities in the classical um, uh, case. But uh, this might be work in progress. So how am I doing in time, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Valodya, how am I doing in time? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, OK. So, yeah. So I will come then uh, just very quickly to uh, uh, some recent results on a very, very simple problem, which is, again, uh, a disordered one-dimensional Schrodinger equation, but now we just consider two interacting particles. So the single particle localizes with localization lengths, let's say, xi1. And the question is, uh, how big will be the localization lengths of two interacting particles? And you, of course, perfectly know this is a story which goes more than 20 years back in time and uh, was seemingly resolved, and I want to basically tell you that it was not resolved at all. And uh, uh, so the uh, localization length xi2, of course, will, everyone agrees at least on that, will stay finite for finite values of disorder, but uh, how it will scale with xi1 for weak disorder is uh, an open issue. Uh, and uh, one can, however, also ask, how will the wave packet of two particles spread into this newly accessible volume uh, which exists when you switch on interaction. So here's the Hamiltonian, basically a uh, bose hubbard Hamiltonian, but just with two particles. And we solve this either by 
uh, by diagonalization or by integrating the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in time. It's essentially pro equivalent to a one quantum particle on a square lattice. Yeah, if you look at the basis, you can choose the basis uh, where you put two particles on sites J and K, and then you uh, arrive at the Schrodinger equation, which is, lives on a two-dimensional lattice with some on-site energies epsilon J, K, which are given by epsilon by the uh, single particle uh, on-site energies, and, or the on-site energies of the potential and, of course, the interaction. And on the other side, you can also transform it into normal mode space, or if you wish, Fox space, so into the space of the eigenstates of the non-interacting two-particle problem. And if you go there, what you find is uh, a kind of an effective, again, a one-dimensional problem, but a very multi-channel problem because many uh, of these Fox states are now coupled, and they are again coupled exactly by the same overlap integrals, which we already discussed. And if you try to play here with perturbation theory, again, you find, if you take one of these terms here, you find that perturbation theory will work or will break. Correspondingly, if something happens to this prefactor, which not surprisingly is again given by a ratio of the overlap integral and the difference of two two-particle energies, which essentially is a quadruplet of single particle energies. Right, and then uh, what can we say? So uh, the connectivity uh, difference to the nonlinear classical case is now not L, but L squared. Uh, the equations, however, are linear. The differential equations are linear instead of nonlinear. The width of the spectrum changes. That's not so important. There's a different average spacing. You can try to come up with different games of estimating the localization lengths of two particles, but the, the problem is that you always have to say something intelligent about the overlap integrals. Uh, as for the interaction itself, if the interaction constant u is much bigger than the width of the spectrum, similar to the classical case, you have a kind of a quantum self-trapping if you want. You renormalize the states with two particles on one side out of the rest of the spectrum. They form a narrow band with a very small localization length. The rest of the uh, spectrum corresponds to a spinless fermion problem with two particles. So nothing interesting happening there. When you have very small u, you have, of course, uh, weak effects. So the best uh, thing is to choose u of order one or two in this uh, setting. So then you can uh, try to calculate numerically the localization lengths of two interacting particles, the largest possible, which uh, uh, you see here in this result. You maybe not, don't see it. This is the ratio of xi2 to xi1 as a function of u. And what you find is that, surprisingly, even if you go to disorder strengths uh, down from disorder strength 4 to disorder strength 2, when you change the localization length from 6 to about uh, 24, you still observe that your uh, two-particle localization length is of the order of 2 or 3, maybe, times a single-particle localization length. Not a big effect. Nothing really interesting seems to happen there. And... Uh, but things do happen. But uh, all the numerics which were done so far uh, in some of or in all of these papers which are listed here uh, were uh, doing, were playing in this ballpark of uh, strengths of disorder. And then they tried to uh, find some, uh, some scaling laws and whatever fitting some uh, exponents. It's all garbage basically because uh, these studies were not done in the right uh, regime. Moreover, in, uh, uh, in some of these papers, there were also wrong assumptions about, uh, about the statistics of overlap integrals. And uh, like, for instance, in these uh, two first papers by Shepeliansky and Imri. Uh, but the, the truth is that when you go to very weak disorder, uh, you will see, as you now see here in these figures, you will see that uh, something happens to the statistics of these overlap integrals, and actually it's not surprising at all what happens. So look at these results which we derived for W equal 0.5. We went to very weak disorder. We cannot do any calculations of the two-particle problem there, but we can still solve the single-particle problem. And the localization length here is already 400. So it's a very big localization length. And then what we do is we find one single particle eigenstate. We identify all other single particle eigenstates which live in its volume. And then we have this set of eigenstates. We sort them with respect to energy. 
And then we plot uh, the uh, two indices. We plot an index which counts them along the x and y axis. And then a point in this two-dimensional plane is one Fox state of the non-interacting problem. And then, for instance, if we take this Fox state to be here in the middle of this, uh, this uh, two-dimensional finite uh, square, if you want, then we can ask what are the overlap integrals with all the other Fox states uh, which are defined by the same uh, single particle eigenstates which we found. And what you see is at very weak, at, at higher uh, values of disorder, I don't show you these pictures, you get basically here a mess. You get the mess which was assumed also in most of these papers which are cited here. However, when you go to very weak disorder, what you find is that this mess clears out and most of the other Fox states are not connected to our reference Fox state, but only those which are arranged along these two lines here are strongly connected. And uh, if you think about where these lines come from, you immediately see that this is restoring of uh, translation invariance because you go to very weak disorder. You have to see some kind of momentum conservation uh, uh, restoring, uh, but uh, you see lines which maybe you didn't expect here, uh, and this comes from the fact that your eigenstates are localized, so you don't talk about periodic boundary conditions, but about simply fixed boundary conditions. So just do the game of uh, momentum conservation in fixed boundary conditions, and you'll see that you get such lines along which uh, overlap integrals are non-zero, while in the rest of the region they are zero. Okay, so uh, this is uh, to say what that uh, all these previous studies are, are doing basically wrong assumptions with respect to the overlap integrals. But the next surprising thing is, which probably is the last one where I stop, uh, is that if you now take this, this reference state here, uh, Fox state in the center, and now you ask yourself uh, how many other Fox states are really connected in the sense of breakdown of perturbation theory. So in the sense of, uh, of uh, this prefactor becoming larger than one. And then what you find, so you can count them, you find that they are, the positions of these, of these other Fox states are indeed located along the uh, lines of strong overlap integrals, uh, not along the diagonal line, obviously, because there you change the energy, but along the interdiagonal, where the energy is roughly the same. And then if you now count this connectivity uh, numerically and you do an average, what you find is that is these numbers. So you see that even at uh, strengths of disorder two, the connectivity is roughly one, which means nothing. You, that's why you get the, a localization length increase of factor of two or three. But if you go down to even smaller values of disorder, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, and 0.35, you start to see that the connectivity increases quite a bit. Uh, now, whether that will lead to an increase of the localization length of quite a bit, I don't know. And maybe there are experts in the audience who can tell uh, how that can be interpreted. But at least uh, there is room for some uh, expectations that there might be uh, uh, a proper whatever dependence of Xi2 scaling or not on Xi1, which is located in that uh, regime of very weak disorder, where so far all the numerics failed to, to enter to. And uh, with that, probably I should stop and I skip the last thing. And I want to uh, thank all uh, the uh, colleagues, friends, co-authors, which you see here. And of course, Im most importantly, I want to thank Boris, who uh, discussed all these issues over many years and whose help was, uh, of course, and is, and hope also will be, uh, always very illuminating and, and important. And not only that, also, you see that I recently I, uh, I moved to different places. So this is Auckland. And uh, then, more recently, we started to set up something in South Korea. And again, uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, Boris, who is actively helping us uh, to, to do nice science. And uh, with that, I come to the most important, and actually the only important part of this talk, uh, which is I want uh, to wish Boris that you uh, will always find time, as you did before, also for the future, to do innovative work in any conditions, even on the most beautiful and most remote islands on this world, but at the same time that you will also always find time to share with friends and have nice food in any place 
on this world. So happy birthday, Boris. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.